Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Well, as hard as it is to believe, we are now three quarters of the way through 2023. If you've been tuning into the channel for a while now, then you likely know that can mean only one thing. It's time for another quarterly installment of Dumbest Criminals, our compilation series where we take a look at some of the dumbest criminals and crime stories that we've covered so far in a given year on Crimes of the Week. One thing to keep in mind is that these segments have not been edited since they appeared in their respective lists, so references to specific days of the week, as well as other small details, may no longer apply. As always, be sure to let us know in the comments below if you enjoy this series, and to look out for another one of these videos later in the week covering stories exclusively from the international edition of our show. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. Authorities in Atlanta, Georgia say that an armed robber walked away pretty much empty-handed this week after he attempted to hold up a local business but was snubbed by his would-be victims. According to reports, the incident took place on the afternoon of July 3rd at the Nail First Nail Salon on Piedmont Road. Surveillance footage captured of the bizarre incident shows as the unidentified suspect walks in just after 2.35 p.m holding what appears to be a handgun concealed in a bag strapped around his shoulder. He proceeds to point the weapon in the direction of several people before starting to yell at everyone inside to give him all of their money. This is the point at which you would normally expect the terrified victims to show some kind of a reaction to what was going on, to comply with the suspect's demands, maybe try and reason with him, or even attempt to run for their lives. However, that's not what happened in this case. No, instead, pretty much everyone just ignored the suspect. And here's the thing, it actually seems to have worked. In the footage, the suspect can be seen repeating his demands for cash several times, as everyone just sort of sits there and looks at him. The business's owner even picks up a phone call during the incident, casually walking away while refusing to acknowledge the robber. While the suspect did snatch a woman's phone when she got up and tried to walk out the door, she doesn't appear all that bothered. Instead, she stands outside for a few moments before coming back inside. By that time, the suspect had apparently realized that his plan was a failure, and he walks out of the nail salon having taken zero dollars in cash. In interviews after the strange crime, witnesses admitted that they were frightened, though did their best to follow the lead of the salon's owner, who tried to appear relaxed. Police did, however, caution the public afterwards, saying in general it's best to comply with demands in these situations, since you never know what a given suspect is capable of. At the time of this recording, authorities say that they are still seeking to identify the culprit behind this week's incident. Anyone with information is encouraged to reach out to the Atlanta police or Crime Stoppers. Representatives from Florida's Hernando County Sheriff's Office say that one of their own employees is facing multiple charges this week following a recent incident in which they accidentally shot themselves, then tried to cover up the situation by fabricating a story about an attempted carjacking. The case began sometime on June 30th when 21-year-old Dakota Wood, who at the time worked for the Sheriff's Office as a telecommunicator, reported that he had been shot during an incident in the community of Spring Hill. Wood said that he had been sitting in his vehicle in Linda Peterson Park when two black men had approached him, pulled out a gun, and threatened him. He claimed that the man had tried to steal his car, and when he resisted, he was shot in the thigh. He said the suspects collected the shell casing and fled the scene, during which time he was able to grab his own weapon and fire several rounds in self-defense. Wood also claimed he was pretty sure he hit one of the men several times. However, while being treated in the hospital for his gunshot wound, Wood's story allegedly fell apart. He later admitted that he made the whole thing up, saying instead that he was upset because of problems he was having with his girlfriend and that he had simply been playing with his gun in the vehicle when it accidentally went off. In a statement after news about the case broke, Sheriff's Office representatives said that these kind of situations were, quote, relatively rare, unfortunate, and unpleasant, and promised that Wood was going to be held accountable. 
The 21-year-old has since resigned from his position and is now facing charges of tampering with or fabricating physical evidence, false reports of commission of crimes, and discharging a firearm in public or residential property. A suspected DUI driver reportedly found himself on the receiving end of some pretty terrifying instant karma this week after he allegedly caused an accident with a local sheriff's deputy. According to reports, the whole thing went down on July 12th when a deputy with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office was driving north on a section of road in the city of Dunedin. It was just after 9 p.m. and he was approaching Cedar Street when out of nowhere a man in a Honda Accord drove out into the middle of the road in front of him. It happened fast enough that the deputy could not stop in time, sending him crashing into the Honda's driver's side door. While thankfully neither the deputy nor the driver were seriously injured, it apparently didn't take long to figure out the main cause of the accident. The driver, later identified as 70-year-old Edward Parsons, was allegedly quite drunk. He also had no driver's license or registration for the Honda he was driving. After being treated for non-life-threatening injuries, he was arrested and charged with DUI involving property damage, failure to obtain a Florida driver's license, and failure to register a vehicle in Florida. Authorities in Clay County, Missouri say that a 19-year-old man is facing serious charges this week after he allegedly swatted a car manufacturing plant, forcing a massive evacuation. According to reports, the incident began at around 5.20 p.m. on July 18th when police received an alarming report from Ford's Kansas City Assembly Plant, located in the village of Clay Como. The facility had received a threatening phone call from a man who said that he had barricaded himself in a bathroom on the building's second floor and was armed with an AK-47 as well as an unknown quantity of C4 explosives. Understandably, the plant was forced to shut down immediately and its roughly 2,200 employees were evacuated. A large police response was quickly organized, with dozens of officers soon arriving at the scene. They searched the facility for six hours before it was conclusively determined that the threatening call had been a hoax. Following an investigation, police arrested 19-year-old Zachariah A. Peterson in connection with the incident. Authorities now allege that the teenager swatted the manufacturing plant to try and get his friend the day off of work. For those unfamiliar with the term, swatting is the process of making a prank call to emergency services with the intention of drawing the largest armed police response possible to a given address. As we've mentioned in reports about similar incidents, the so-called prank is incredibly dangerous and has led to deaths in the past. At the time of this recording, police say they have no reason to believe that Peterson's friend was in on his plan, though the 19-year-old reportedly claimed he was forced to make the call. Peterson has been charged with making a terroristic threat, and if convicted, could be facing up to seven years in prison and a fine of $10,000. Authorities in Volusia County, Florida were left both relieved and seriously irritated this week after what they initially thought was a terrifying armed kidnapping situation instead turned out to be an 11-year-old girl's idea of a funny joke. According to reports, it all started at around 9.45 a.m. on July 26th when dispatchers with the Volusia County Sheriff's Office began receiving disturbing texts that had been sent to 911. They were from an 11-year-old girl who said that her 14-year-old friend had been abducted by an unknown armed man in a white van who had proceeded to drive south on Interstate 95 in Oak Hill. Given the seemingly critical nature of the crime, a large police response was mobilized immediately with officers from multiple different law enforcement agencies sent to help. Air support was even called in in an effort to locate the suspect's vehicle faster. Over the next hour or so, dispatchers continued to receive updates from the 11-year-old by text, who provided descriptions of the alleged suspect and said that she was following in a blue jeep. However, police were unable to find the suspect or the white van in question. They would soon learn 
that this was because they didn't exist. After tracing the phone that was sending the text messages, officers were able to pinpoint it to an address in the neighboring city of Port Orange. When they paid a visit to the residence, they were greeted by a confused man who turned out to be the father of the 11-year-old girl. He said that she was inside with the rest of the family. Sure enough, when officers went inside, they found the 11-year-old sitting in the living room holding her phone. Moments later, she received a call from 911 dispatchers. When questioned, the girl apparently admitted that she had made the whole thing up, saying that it was a prank inspired by a YouTube challenge she had seen. She said that she, quote, thought it would be funny. Things presumably got less hilarious, though, when she was arrested and charged with making a false police report concerning the use of a firearm in a violent manner and misuse of 911. While police appeared to show some sympathy for the girl given her age, they were quick to note the seriousness with which they treat these kinds of matters, with a representative saying, quote, This kind of prank activity is dangerous. We're going to investigate every incident, but today it wasted valuable resources that might have helped someone else who legitimately needed our help. They also reminded parents to make sure they are closely monitoring their children's social media accounts. Authorities in Erie County, Ohio, say that a bumbling would-be burglar was left pretty embarrassed this week after his plan to rob a bank went sideways, leaving him not only empty-handed, but also comically trapped in front of police. According to reports, it all started at around 2 a.m. on July 26th when officers from the Huron Police Department received a notification that an alarm had been triggered at the local Vacation Land Federal Credit Union. When they arrived, strange noises immediately caught their attention, which they realized were coming from an access door above the bank's drive through Officers watched for a few seconds as the door opened, revealing a masked man who had obviously broken in. Without checking to see if anyone was there, the man dropped a bag he was carrying to the ground before starting to lower himself from the access door. It was at this point that police announced themselves. Evidently startled that he had been caught, the man fell from the access door right into a large wheeled recycling bin below the door. Realizing that he was now trapped and seemingly resigned to his fate, he could be heard on body camera footage saying, Ah, oh, before surrendering without any kind of struggle. Things got even more embarrassing for the suspect when, while being placed under arrest, the bin he was in gave out for a second time, causing him to fall towards the ground. After being taken into custody, the man was identified as 27-year-old Tristan Heidi. Heidi reportedly continued to cooperate with police, admitting that he had been trying to rob the bank and saying that he had done it because he was broke. Heidi also reportedly revealed that his robbery plans had been a bust even before police had arrived. At the time he was caught, he had actually been leaving the building empty-handed after failing to secure any cash. Funnily enough, the only thing that he had successfully stolen was the recycling bin that he had fallen into, which he had initially used to climb up to the access door. Heidi is now facing charges of breaking and entering, possession of criminal tools, and safe cracking. Authorities in Sandusky, Ohio say that a self-described Christian woman definitely wasn't doing God's work this week when she allegedly harassed and assaulted a young boy at a local water park. The incident began sometime around noon on July 27th when police were called to the Cedar Point Shores water park with reports of a confrontation at one of the kids' pools. When they arrived, they were approached by a woman named Jennifer Hutton who said that her son had been verbally abused and assaulted by a woman. Jennifer explained that while in the pool, the woman had called her son a brat and a fat ass and had pushed him off of an inflatable toy. When officers approached the woman allegedly responsible for the incident, who identified herself as Jennifer Lee Miller, she denied most of the altercation. She admitted that she had called the child a brat, but said she never swore at him or touched him, adding that she was, quote, a Christian woman, a grandmother, and she wouldn't do such a thing. While some witnesses contradicted Miller's statements, saying that they had seen her at least swearing at the child, police decided to let the incident go. 
However, they warned Miller that if she wasn't being honest with them, or if there was another incident, she would be charged with disorderly conduct. Miller apparently agreed. However, after leaving the water park, police learned that Miller had provided them with a fake name, address, and phone number. They went back and managed to find her again, at which point she claimed she didn't have an ID on her, and evidently, without a hint of irony, said she felt like she was being harassed. Police eventually managed to identify the woman as Janet Nail, a 67-year-old Michigan resident. She was subsequently arrested and charged with obstruction. Authorities in Volusia County, Florida say that a 35-year-old murder suspect recently landed herself with additional charges after she allegedly made a rather bizarre and brazen attempt to destroy evidence during questioning. The whole thing started at around 1.46 a.m. on July 1st, when police were called with reports of a fire at a residence on the 600 block of Clark Street in Daytona Beach. Officers arrived at the scene to find that a pile of clothes had been set on fire in one of the second floor bedrooms of the shared residence. However, it was when they extinguished the flames that things really started to get serious. During a search of the property, they found the body of an elderly man lying face down in a blood spattered room. He had suffered blunt force trauma wounds to the head as well as stabbing injuries to the torso. After speaking with the property owner, the victim was identified as 79-year-old Michael Sarasoli, one of the tenants who lived there. Michael's cell phone was recovered at the scene, along with another cell phone that had a blood-covered knife on top of it. The landlord said the second phone belonged to the other tenant that lived at the residence, 35-year-old Nicole Max. Roughly two hours later, Max was spotted by police walking barefoot and wearing a ripped shirt outside of a fast food restaurant in the neighboring community of Holly Hill. She had blood on her leg, and when officers approached her, Max reportedly dropped a knife and a hammer at their feet. When questioned about what she had been doing that morning, the 35-year-old was reportedly evasive and kept changing her story. At first, she said that she had no connection to Michael or the property where his body was found, at one point saying that she had been homeless for the last four years. After admitting that she knew the victim, Max stated that she hadn't seen him that day, before changing again and admitting that Michael was her roommate and that she had been at their shared residence earlier, though claimed that she had only gone up to the second floor to, quote, feed her spiders. After obtaining a warrant to collect DNA evidence from the 35-year-old's body, police reportedly continued their questioning, at which point Max asked for a can of Diet Mountain Dew. Officers obliged, only for Max to play around with the drink for some time, before finally attempting to pour it over her body and hair, in what authorities say was an attempt to destroy evidence. While the sucralose in artificial sweeteners has apparently been shown in studies to have the potential to break down the biological components that make up DNA, unfortunately for Max, her alleged attempt was unsuccessful. Samples collected from Max's clothing ended up matching DNA found on Michael's body. It likely wouldn't have mattered either way, though, as Max's DNA was also reportedly found on the handle of the knife that was found at the crime scene. Instead, Max's stunt apparently earned her additional charges of tampering with evidence and resisting arrest with violence on top of the premeditated first-degree murder charge she was already facing in the case. So far, it appears that the motive behind the murder has not been released. Representatives from Florida's Bay County Sheriff's Office say that a Georgia man is facing numerous charges this week following an equally bizarre and destructive burglary at a local church. The incident began sometime after 8 on the morning of August 4th when Bay County deputies were called to the Emerald Beach Church of God in the town of Panama City Beach. An employee of the church said that she had fled the property after hearing breaking glass, which she realized was the sound of someone breaking in. Officers reportedly arrived at the scene to find the suspect, later identified as Derek Porter, who was allegedly in the middle of a burglary at the property. After smashing his way inside with a cinder block, authorities say that Porter did roughly $8,000 worth of damage to the church, 
then loaded several items including a television, a computer, and the church's money bag into his truck. Upon being caught red-handed, Porter apparently stated that he could not remember what had happened during several periods of time while he was in the church, something that might be explained by the methamphetamine that was allegedly found inside his pocket at the scene. However, Porter apparently did remember one thing quite vividly. He said that at one point he had baptized himself in the church's baptistry pool and claimed that something had held his head down in the water. It seems that Porter wasn't the only one who enjoyed the pool, though. Upon being let inside, one of the police dogs who had been brought to the scene immediately made a beeline for the water and jumped in, prompting audible laughs in one of the officer's body cam footage. Porter has now been charged with burglary of an occupied structure, criminal mischief, possession of methamphetamine, and possession of drug paraphernalia in connection with the incident. At the time of the crime, he was reportedly already out on bond for another burglary in Georgia. Authorities in Drew County, Arkansas, say that a 24-year-old fugitive is in custody this week after he allegedly sought employment in one of the most questionable places imaginable for someone in his situation. According to reports, the whole thing began earlier this week when officials with the local police department in the town of Monticello received an online application from a man in South Carolina. The man's resume appeared to check all the boxes, so he was invited to come down to Arkansas to discuss the position further, as well as to take part in a physical fitness test. However, upon arriving at the station, officials noticed some discrepancies in the man's physical appearance while conducting his background check. They did a little more digging and soon discovered why. His real name was Justin C. Carter a 24-year-old fugitive from Georgia who had a nationwide warrant out for his arrest for a parole violation. After making this discovery, Monticello police invited Carter back the following day to the local high school track where they conducted his physical fitness test. As soon as it was over, he was placed under arrest and transported back to Georgia. At the time of this recording, it has not been reported what crime Carter was on parole for at the time of his arrest. It's also unclear why the 24-year-old thought applying for a job with any police department was a good idea, considering he was a wanted man. Authorities in Volusia County, Florida, say that a 29-year-old local woman is facing charges this week after she allegedly served up quite the disturbing nightcap to her live-in boyfriend. According to reports, the incident began in the early morning hours of August 18th, when police received a call from a 24-year-old man in the community of Delian Springs. The man said that he believed that he had been the victim of a poisoning and that he needed immediate help. When officers arrived at the scene, they encountered the 24-year-old, who was so ill he could barely explain what happened. He said that he had been vomiting for at least the past 30 minutes and had barely been able to call for help. Despite this, before being rushed off for treatment, the man somehow managed to give police a basic overview of what had happened. The 24-year-old stated that a short time earlier, he had received a call from his 29-year-old girlfriend, Veronica Klein, who had been out drinking at a local bar. She asked him to make some cocktails so that they could continue drinking together when she got home. While things initially went smoothly, they soon went off the rails when Klein took over making the drinks. Not long after, the 24-year-old began to feel ill and began vomiting uncontrollably. It was at this point that Klein allegedly revealed she had spiked at least two of his beverages with raid insect poison in an attempt to kill him. Even more disturbing, Klein allegedly said she planned to do the same thing to their one-year-old child. The 24-year-old was apparently able to back up what he said by providing an audio recording of Klein during which she admitted to poisoning him. While Klein had reportedly fled the residence in the time it took her boyfriend to call 911, luckily for authorities, she didn't get very far. A police canine was ultimately able to find her hiding in some bushes, and she was placed under arrest and charged with a felony count of poisoning. According to reports, Klein has previous criminal convictions, two of which involve the, quote, improper exhibition of a weapon.
Indiana state troopers apparently wanted to send the message that they aren't messing around when it comes to impaired driving after they arrested and charged a local man this week who was behind the wheel of a children's toy. According to reports, it all started around 9 p.m. on August 23rd when a state police trooper spotted the 51-year-old suspect, John McKee, driving a blue Power Wheels Jeep on North 2nd Street in Vincennes Township. Though McKee was apparently pulled over originally because he was driving the toy Jeep on the road with no lights or reflectors in the dark, things escalated when the trooper noticed some signs that the 51-year-old might be intoxicated. He was asked to perform a roadside sobriety test, which he allegedly failed. After being taken to a nearby hospital, it was reportedly determined that McKee was under the influence of both marijuana and methamphetamine, and he was placed under arrest. He is now facing a felony charge of operating a vehicle while intoxicated with a prior conviction. The Power Wheels Jeep, meanwhile, which reportedly has a maximum speed of 5 miles per hour, was picked up by a local towing company. Representatives from Nebraska's Lancaster County Sheriff's Office are reminding the public of the dangers of drinking and driving this week after they released body cam footage from a DUI stop earlier this year that was as unbelievably terrifying as it was unbelievably stupid. According to reports, it all started one night back in March when the Sheriff's Office received a 911 call from a man who said that he needed to report some dangerous driving. He said he was traveling down a section of Highway 77 in Lancaster County and had just had an extremely close call with a truck, which he claimed was traveling in the wrong direction and had nearly run him off the road. Though the man appeared genuinely rattled by what had happened on the phone, what he didn't realize was that the dangerous driving he was reporting was in fact his own. You see, he was the one on the wrong side of the road. He just didn't know it because he was drunk. Thanks to the very accurate coordinates that the man was able to provide about his location, he was quickly spotted by a Lancaster Sheriff's deputy who pulled him over. It was only at this point that the driver apparently started to piece together what had actually happened. When asked if he knew why he'd been pulled over, the man replied, quote, Yeah, because I was on the wrong side of the road. He tried to claim that it was because he had missed an exit. Understandably, this explanation did not cut it, especially when the driver was found to have a blood alcohol content of twice the legal limit. After being arrested, the man admitted that he had essentially called 911 on himself, leading to this ridiculous exchange. Were you the one that called in? Yep. You were? Yeah, because I thought somebody was on the wrong side of the road, bro. But it turned out it was you. Yep, look at dumb At the time of this recording, the driver's name has not been released. Authorities in Indian River County, Florida say that a man is in custody this week after he allegedly broke into his ex-girlfriend's house and attacked her because she mocked the size of his penis. According to reports, the incident began sometime on the night of August 28th when the 42-year-old victim was talking to the suspect, 30-year-old Rashad McGriff, over text. At some point during this exchange, the victim reportedly sent McGriff a photo of another man's genitalia captioning it with a taunting message saying that he had a small penis. Instead of replying with his own insult or simply ignoring the message altogether, police say that at around midnight, McGriff drove to his ex-girlfriend's house in the city of Vero Beach. After breaking in, he allegedly went into her bedroom where she was sleeping and proceeded to punch her in the face and choke her. At one point, the 42-year-old claims he also screamed at her, quote, I'll kill you, bitch. Following the attack, McGriff reportedly fled the residence, at which point the victim called 911. He was arrested later that day. According to reports, the 30-year-old is now facing burglary and battery charges in connection with the penis size-related assault. It's expected that he will also face further charges for a parole violation in connection with a firearms possession offense.
Authorities in Phoenix, Arizona say that a 49-year-old local man is in serious trouble this week after he allowed his young son to get behind the wheel of his pickup truck while he allegedly accompanied him as a drunken passenger. According to reports, the incident began at around 3.40 p.m. on September 2nd, when a trooper with the Arizona Department of Public Safety spotted a red pickup truck driving dangerously on State Route 101. Not only was the vehicle speeding, but it was recklessly changing lanes, a situation that could have easily led to a crash. The trooper began pursuing the truck, leading to a chase that lasted for approximately three minutes until the vehicle pulled over near the 7th Street off-ramp. That's when the trooper apparently discovered that the driver was a 10-year-old boy. It turned out that the boy wasn't alone, though. For some inexplicable reason, the boy's 49-year-old father, Alvaro Ovando Alvarez, had not only allegedly sanctioned the trip, but had come along as a passenger. I mean, he was apparently drunk, so that probably played a role. But if you ask me, that's pretty wild even for a drunk decision. Anyway, Alvarez was arrested and has now been charged with aggravated DUI, child abuse and endangerment, possession of an open container of alcohol, and unlawfully permitting a minor to drive. The boy, meanwhile, is not facing legal consequences because, you know, he's 10 and it's not his fault his dad's an idiot. Authorities in Maycomb County, Michigan, say that a Canadian man is in serious trouble this week after he illegally crossed the border in fairly bizarre fashion and then allegedly tried to steal a gun from a local pawn shop. According to reports, the whole thing started recently when Ontario resident 24-year-old Jeremy James Wallace had his guns confiscated due to an unspecified firearms offense. Unable to legally purchase additional weapons, though apparently determined to skirt the ban, it was at this point that he came up with a plan. In the early morning hours of September 6th, Wallace allegedly put on a wetsuit and flippers and swam across the St. Clair River from the village of Sombra, Ontario, into Michigan. Once there, he traveled roughly 12 miles to the Metro Pawn and Gun Store in the village of New Haven, where he posed as a customer. After having employees at the pawn shop bring him out a 22 caliber handgun to look at, Wallace apparently inquired about a second firearm. When the employee who was speaking with him went to get the weapon, Wallace allegedly grabbed the first gun off the counter along with two empty magazines and fled. Unfortunately for Wallace, he didn't make it very far before police arrived at the scene. They reportedly witnessed him running around the back of the pawn shop and into a wooded area where he was tracked down and arrested. Upon being taken into custody, Wallace reportedly shared the details of his scheme. He told them about the wetsuit, the flippers, and the flotation device he'd used to cross the river, and was also allegedly in possession of a pistol crossbow, some ammunition, and a hammer. He said he'd brought the additional tools in case the pawn shop was closed when he got there and he needed to break in. Authorities say that Wallace is now facing multiple charges, including improper entry by an alien, being an alien in possession of a firearm and ammunition, and possession of a stolen firearm. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care. <laughs>